Okay, so we are making our way through Unit 8 of Humble Yourself, The Way to Greatness. And Unit 8 is the way of salvation, which is abide and endure to the end. So we've made our way up to point C, which is waiting upon the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord is something that we have to discipline ourselves in. If we really are going to abide in Jesus and keep his way, and if we're going to be true to what we talked about in a prior segment about today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Well, one of the ways that we will be prone to harden our heart to the voice of the Lord is when we think something is urgent or we want to get something done, but God has not yet authored it. But we want it now, and we don't want to wait for God's timing for it. And when we refuse to wait upon the Lord correctly, we can really cause some problems in our lives, and there are other ramifications that impact other people as well. So waiting upon the Lord It is one of the primary ways that day by day by day by day to take the posture of one who is waiting upon the Lord subjects us to God and his timing and his purposes in our lives. In addition, of course, to waiting for the Lord to return. Waiting in the day-to-day is just the warm-up and the practice to help us endure in waiting for the return of the Lord to be faithful to the bigger promise that he has made, that he is coming back and will bring us into the world to come. Waiting upon the Lord is an act of humbling ourselves before him to demonstrate that he is the master and we are the servants. So let's look one of my favorite scriptures, Psalm 123, verse 2. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maidservant look to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord, our God, until he has mercy on us. So a servant has no individuality or purpose of their own other than to serve the master. In the days that this was written, a servant or a slave or a maidservant would be property of the master, owned by the master. They don't have anything else going on. They don't have anything else to do. Their entire life is dedicated and owned by the master. And so a servant's job is to wait upon the master to know what it is the master wants done. Everything about a servant's life is devoted to making the master happy. It is not for a servant to make up whatever it is that they want to do. You know, like it's not for a servant to just make up their own interpretation of what the master desires. Everything that a servant does is for the purpose of fulfilling the will of the master. And so let's use that as our model, as our example for how we should be engaging with God. So waiting upon the Lord is an act of denying ourselves, our own will and our own desires, and our own fleshly desire for activity. Activity, being busy, makes us feel important, makes us feel useful, makes us feel productive. But if that activity, you can be busy, 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 busy. But if all that activity that you're doing that makes you feel so useful and so needed by other people and so powerful and so productive in this world, if all of that activity is going to burn in the day of judgment and and is not what the master wants you doing at all, then what are you doing? I mean, really, what are you doing? So let's look at a couple of verses. Psalm 37, starting with verse 7. Be still before the Lord. And wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. 
So if you see other people are prospering because they're so busy, 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 and you want to get busy, busy, busy so you can prosper too, it says, don't fret about them. Don't think about that. You be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourselves. It tends only to evil. Get your eyes off of what everyone else is doing and how busy everyone else is. Get your eyes on Jesus and wait for him and his purpose and his timing in your life. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord will inherit the land. So there it is. You want it's your incentive? You can either be wicked and busy, busy doing your own thing and get cut off with people who are in rebellion against God, or you can wait for the Lord and inherit everything that he has promised for you. Sounds like a good deal to me. Psalm 37, it's a long psalm. It's one of my favorite psalms, but we're skipping from verse 9 to verse 34. Wait for the Lord and keep his way, and he will exalt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. So it might be challenging now to learn how to wait upon the Lord. Or I shared with you in a prior segment how challenging it was for me to learn how to rest in the Lord. Waiting and rest, they kind of go hand in hand. They go together like peas and carrots. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. Do things his way. And he will cause you to inherit everything that has been promised. Even when all those people that are so busy, busy are cut off. Psalm 130, verse 5, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Now, if you know anything about watchmen, watchmen wait for the morning. They, they are looking out into the abyss of darkness, and their job is to look for the slightest hint of the dawn, the dawn of the new day. There are watchmen that are appointed for the determining of the beginning of the new month because the new month begins when the first sliver of the new moon can be seen in the sky. They've got to look for it so intently that it can't even really be seen that well, but they're looking they're waiting, they're watching, and then they cry out, they announce the new moon, the new month has begun. And it's the same with the morning. The new day begins with that first hint of dawn, but they wait patiently, expectantly all through the night for that light of dawn to come. Isaiah 64, verse 4. Now, this is quoted by Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, but it's quoted a little differently than what it reflects in the Old Testament Hebrew. Isaiah 64, 4. For from old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, God works salvation and victory for those who wait for him. And one last, another verse that's, again, one of my favorites that will help you to stand, help you to be still, help you to rest, help you to wait upon the Lord. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Now, where is that? That's where Israel, the whole nation of Israel, is standing at the banks of the Red Sea, and the Egyptian army is charging behind them, ready to kill them, ready to take them back into slavery. There looks like there is no way out. But in that very moment where all this pressure is on and nobody knows how God is going to save his people, the scripture says, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. So friends, we've got to learn to be still and wait upon the Lord, trusting that he will, in his time, bring everything that he desires for us to pass.
So I'm going to walk us through some examples of people in the Bible who had to wait upon the Lord, even for the fulfillment of the prophetic vision or the prophetic word over their life while they were still alive. Because as I said, waiting for the Lord in your life today is what will build your strength and endurance for waiting for Jesus, who is the one worth waiting for. So there are lots of scriptures in your study guide. I can't say that we're going to read through all of them, but they are there for you so that you can do the work for yourself. You can read through them in your study guide. You can go into the Bible itself and read through the whole context of these stories. But I'm just going to do a recap of the stories that are highlighted. So let's open up with Habakkuk. Habakkuk, he was given a vision from the Lord that Babylon was going to come and destroy the the southern kingdom of Judah and send them into exile. But then ultimately, Babylon itself would face judgment and be destroyed. And so the Lord then encouraged Habakkuk, yes, this vision, you can't even believe it, even though I've told you what's going to happen. But God said to Habakkuk, the vision is for an appointed time. It's going to happen. It might seem to take a long time to happen, but it will come. And this is a verse that will be familiar to many of you because this is often spoken when you're waiting for something that you know the Lord has spoken to your heart. People will quote this scripture, and I've even had the Lord quote this scripture to me many times. If it's something the Lord has spoken, it will surely come to pass, and it will come to pass in God's timing. So this is Habakkuk chapter 2, starting with verse 2. And the Lord answered me, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, so that he may run who reads it. For the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Hallelujah. So God is saying, this vision is going to come. Keep your faith in me. The righteous will live by faith. And that is one of the most often quoted scriptures in the New Covenant. Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous will live by faith. We're not going to live by all our other works and doing our own thing. We're going to live by faith in Jesus Christ and what he has done for us, knowing that he is coming back to claim us as his own and bring us into the world to come. The proud, who are part of the Babylonian system, they are puffed up. They will not humble themselves to believe God. They live not by waiting upon the Lord, but by their own devices. But the righteous, they live by waiting upon the Lord, by keeping the way of the Lord, by faith and trust in the Lord our God, maker of heaven and earth, the only one, the most high God, the one who will judge in the end. Hallelujah. All right, so here we'll go into some examples. An example of someone who waited upon God, or, eh, well, not exactly. He did and he didn't. Abraham, even the father of the faithful, waited on God, but then got impatient and didn't wait on God. So after years of waiting for God to fulfill the prophetic word that he had given to Abraham, that Abraham was going to have a son and a tribe and a people of his own, and that God was going to bless the whole world through Abraham's people, Abraham's seed, Abraham grew impatient. And so did his wife, Sarah, who was barren. And she looked at the situation and she's like, this ain't happening. We got to do something else. We got to come up with a plan. We got to scheme something up. So Sarah came up with a plan that Abraham would sleep with her servant, Hagar. Now, in that culture, in that day, because Sarah owned Hagar, Hagar was a slave of Sarah and property of Sarah, any child born to Hagar would technically be considered Sarah's child. So Sarah conceived this plan where Abraham would sleep with Hagar and have a child who would be Sarah's. And then that would be the child that God could fulfill his promises through, right? 
At least that was the plan. Well, unfortunately, that was not God's plan. That was man's plan to try to make the word of God happen faster. But it didn't work that way. So the scriptures are there in your study guide. When the time came that God came to Abraham and said, you're going to have a son through Sarah and you're going to name him Isaac, Abraham was like, what? Oh, no. What? Can't Ishmael live before you? And God said, no. Ishmael was created by your flesh. What I'm doing is creating something by the promise. So Abraham, even though he had invested years, 13 years, raising Ishmael as his firstborn, his only son, God said, no, that's not your firstborn. No, that's not who the covenant is going to pass through. No, you did that on your own. That wasn't what I was telling you to wait for. So God did say at that time, I'll bless Ishmael because he's yours. But the word over Ishmael's life was he's going to be a wild donkey of a man. And that came to pass. So if somebody comes and presents a Hagar to you, don't take the bait. Don't take the opportunity. Say no. Be strong. Be courageous and wait upon the Lord. Another example of someone who had to wait upon the Lord was Joseph. Joseph, as a teenager, had dreams that his whole family was going to bow down to him. And he told his whole family that they were going to bow down to him. And you know what? They weren't so happy about that. They threw him in a pit. They left him for dead. But the scripture says that Jacob, his father who loved him dearly, Jacob, who knew the covenant promises of God, that God was going to, through their line, through the line of Abraham, Isaac, and now this was Jacob, bring the one who would crush the head of the serpent. And then he hears that Joseph has had dreams from God that the all that everyone's going to bow down to him. So Jacob, it says, kept these sayings in mind. And, you know, he did rebuke Joseph like, hey, you know, don't 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 be saying that too much. But jo- Jacob kept it in mind. He was considering he was a wise old man by this point in time. And he's like, hmm, what could God be doing? But remember, Joseph, he was thrown in a pit, left for dead, sold into slavery, brought into Potiphar's house, accused of rape, which he did not commit, thrown into prison, waited in prison, interpreted some dreams in prison and said, hey, when you get before Pharaoh, remember me. But even after all of that, that was many years that went by. And even after all that, when after he interpreted the dreams, it was two more years after all of that. But Joseph, eventually the word of the Lord came to pass in Joseph's life and all his family bowed down to him when he was the number two next to Pharaoh in all the world. So what the scripture says is that the word of the Lord tested Joseph. It tested his character. Was he going to believe the word of the Lord? Was he going to believe that God would be faithful to fulfill his word? Or was he going to believe his circumstances and what it looked like to himself and even to everyone else around him? Was he going to believe that he was nothing but a slave and a prisoner? Or was he going to believe that God would fulfill the dreams that God had given him? And Joseph passed the test. So another example is David, King David. King David was anointed by Samuel as a shepherd boy. So very similar to Joseph. We don't know the exact number of years for Joseph or for David that they were uh, between the anointing or the, the dreams of Joseph and when the vision came to pass or with David when he was anointed to be king and when he actually became king. But there were the same, you know, they were both teenagers when they had their initial experience. And David we know was 30 years old when he was first anointed king over Judah. And Joseph, it was probably something pretty similar to that. So the waiting period was, you know, probably over a decade, maybe 12, 13 years, something like that. So David was anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel after Saul's heart had turned away. But it, David wasn't the king right away. Just because he had been anointed, just because the word had been spoken over his life, that that's what God had destined him to be, the word didn't, he wasn't the king yet. 
And so in between, he served in Saul's kingdom. Then Saul became ragingly jealous of him and tried to kill him. Then David lived as a fugitive in caves with other people who were in rebellion or disgruntled or in debt or had all sorts of issues. But they came out to David and they said, yeah, you be our leader. And so they came out. And then even after all of that, when Saul finally fell on his sword and was no longer the king of Israel, the Lord told David to go back. And that was the time that David was anointed first only over the king as king of Judah. For seven years, he was king only over the tribe of Judah, his own tribe. So he was still waiting for seven more years for the word to be completely fulfilled where he became king over all Israel. And again, the scriptures are there in your study guide of his anointing, becoming king over Judah, and becoming king over all Israel. There's a long period of time between some of these things. David had to wait for the fullness of the word of God over his life to come to pass. Another example is John the Baptist. John the Baptist, he, the destiny of John the Baptist was prophesied before he was even conceived. An angel visited with his father, Zechariah, in the secret place of the temple and told him, your son is going to come in the power and the spirit of Elijah to make ready for the Lord. The Lord is expecting a people that have been prepared, and your son is the one who's going to prepare them. This was before Zechariah even went back to Elizabeth, his barren wife, to conceive John the Baptist so that he would then nine months later be born. Well, then nine months later, when John the Baptist was born, again, the word of the Lord was spoken over his life. This child will be called a prophet of the Most High, will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, right? So this was before conception and then at birth, John the Baptist's first breath in this world, and he's getting this prophetic word that he's the one who's going to prepare the way for for the Lord. Well, guess what? So John the Baptist knew all about this. His parents knew all about this. And people who were in the room hearing this prophetic word over him knew all about this. And they talked and talked and they chatted, chatted, chatted about who this child might be. But John the Baptist didn't begin ministry for 30 years because John the Baptist was born several months before Jesus was born. And Jesus began his ministry approximately at the age of 30, when he was a full-grown man. And so John the Baptist had to wait until the word of the Lord came to him for him to begin his ministry. He waited out in the wilderness until the word of the Lord came and told him to begin. And there might be times that you have to wait, that you know what the Lord has spoken over your life, you know what God has called you to do, but you do not have the green light from God to do it yet. This is a simple example, but as an example, uh, many of you know that I write books. The Lord has me write a lot of books. Well, two books, there were two books I wrote in the same year. Paul's Prayers and Biblical Healing were both written in the same year. I forget what year it was. But both of those books, I had had the outline for both both of those books for two years before it was the timing of the Lord for me to write them. Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, and I can't say that I even understand all of the detail of why the Lord had me wait. But even though I had the outlines, even though I thought I was ready to write those books— Obviously, it wasn't the timing of the Lord, but I came around into that year that they were written. And in January of that year, I asked the Lord, what are we doing? And he said, you're going to write Paul's prayers and biblical healing and a few other things that we did that year. Hallelujah. So God sometimes has a timing. And if you try to press ahead just because you've got step one, but God hasn't given you a green light to take step two yet, then you're not waiting for the Lord. John the Baptist had to wait until the word of the Lord came to to him in the wilderness saying, now is the time to begin your ministry. And friends, there'll be times when you know from the Lord when you are to begin and when you must continue to wait. We've got to practice the discipline of waiting upon the Lord.
And so the last example, this is beautiful. Jesus himself, always our plumb line, always our perfect example. Jesus himself also, from before he was conceived, from the moment of his birth, he knew, his mother knew, his parents knew that he was called to be the son of God who was going to save the people from their sins. And even at age 12, Jesus went into the temple and Jesus was ready to take on all the religious leaders. He was rebuking them. He was answering all their questions. He was listening to them. And they were amazed at the depth of understanding that he had, even at age 12. Jesus could have begun ministry at age 12, but that wasn't the timing of God. And so instead, what the scripture says is that he went back with his parents and was submissive to them. Jesus waited from age 12 to age 30, 18 more years before it was time for him to begin. And then he said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news, right? He knew now is the time. Now is the time. And even for those of you who love the Bible, his mother had to prod him a little bit because when his mother said, hey, turn that water into wine or, you know, you can fix their wine problem. He said, woman, it's not my time yet. But then it was, that was the first sign that he showed of his glory. It was time to begin his ministry. But Jesus had grown so accustomed to waiting upon God and his timing that he even needed a little prompt from his mama to get things moving when the time fully came. But you will know, you will know from God when it is time. But if you are in a season of waiting, do not be ashamed of your waiting. Be strengthened in your waiting. Waiting in the temporal things for this world of what God has called us to do in this world is what will strengthen our muscles to wait for the Lord and his return. So as far as the return of the Lord is concerned, we are commanded to wait upon his return, wait for him like servants waiting for their master to return. Now, servants waiting for the master to return, servants want the master to find the house swept, put in order, everything running the way that it should, maybe a hot meal on the stove, ready to receive the master. Welcome home, master. We are so overjoyed that you're here. But sometimes I think people treat it more like it's going to be a surprise party when Jesus shows up and they twist the scripture to say, well, he's coming like a thief in the night. It's going to be a surprise. Yeah, but it's not supposed to be like a surprise party on our side where everybody is just kind of chit-chatting, doing their own thing. Yeah, he's not coming yet. No, he's not coming yet. Oh, wait, he's, he's in the driveway. Get everybody assume your position. Get in position. He's here. Sometimes I think people treat the return of the Lord like that. It's not supposed to be like that. You're supposed to be in your position every day, 24 hours a day, waiting like a servant, like a dutiful, faithful servant, waiting for the master to come back and wanting at least your portion of what God has given you to do to be as wonderful and perfect for him as you can possibly make it because you are eagerly anticipating and waiting for his return. Not goofing off, not smacking around the other servants, not helping yourself to the master's goods and his food and his wine and his drink and all of that. No, faithfully focused on the work that he has given you to do, waiting for him to return so you can receive him. And here's one of the several scriptures pertaining to exactly that. This is Luke 12, verse 35. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Hallelujah. Now, friends, in the end times, it's going to be very challenging to stand for Jesus. There's going to be pressure on every side to not continue to wait upon Jesus. There's, it's going to seem irresponsible, illogical, impractical, and even foolish to wait upon the Lord as times get darker and more difficult. But we have to continue to endure and wait for Jesus as serious today as when we first began to follow him, that he is coming imminently, that we want to be those who are ready to receive him. Hallelujah. So James chapter 5 verse 7 says, be patient 
therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. Yes, you have to eagerly expect him and be patient at the same time. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until he receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. So the farmer plants the seeds, and then if the farmer goes out and keeps pulling back the soil to check the seed all the time, he's not going to grow anything. That seed is not going to produce anything. The farmer has to plant the seeds, do what he does, what is his part to do, but the soil brings forth he knows not how. And so we as farmers need to plant the seeds, do the work that God has given us to do, sow even our very lives into the kingdom of God, and then wait. Wait like a farmer. Don't touch it. Leave it alone. Let it grow. Let it do its thing. Be patient. The Lord is coming. Don't mess with the gospel. Don't mess with your version of Jesus, right? Stay true to the the original gospel. Stay true to works that demonstrate that you are following him. Why? Because those who wait upon the Lord will be rewarded and will receive what God has promised. So these scriptures apply both for the temporal things that God has you waiting for in this life, on this side of eternity, but also never forget waiting upon the Lord for him to return. He will come back and fulfill every eternal promise that he has made. This scripture will be familiar to many of you. Isaiah 40, verse 30. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So friends, if you are exhausted, if you are weary, then there's something about the way you're approaching things. You're not really waiting upon the Lord. You're waiting on what the Lord, you want the Lord to do. You're waiting on some kind of result. Waiting upon the Lord is waiting for him waiting with your focus entirely on him. If your focus is purely on Jesus and waiting upon him, he will renew your strength. You will mount up with the ease of an eagle who's not flap, 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 flapping his wings all the time. The eagle just spreads his wings wide and catches a breeze and soars through the air. You will run and not be weary if you are really waiting upon the Lord. Psalm 27, this is David, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord and be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So again, people love to quote, I believe I will look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. But that next verse, you've got to couple it right alongside there. Wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Don't create your own goodness in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, believing that God will be faithful and true to fulfill every promise that he has spoken to your heart in this age and the age to come. And Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. So friends, again, we learned in a prior unit that the way to destruction is pride and arrogance, but the way to salvation is abiding and enduring, waiting upon the Lord, 
even until the end of the age. Mm -hmm.